Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm your host, Andy, and I have Adam here as my co-host. Andy, it's been a heck of a week, but let's do a podcast. All right. I hear you. So we are finally going to do our conditional access episode that we've been talking about. So getting right into it, what is conditional access? I think the term conditional access is something that Microsoft uses a lot in their product marketing, but basically it's when you're trying to access any type of system or data, certain conditions have to be met in order for that access to be granted. And Microsoft has different conditions that they laid out and other identity providers also have different conditions. We've talked about Okta and IBM previously on this podcast where they have certain conditions that are built into theirs. And conditional access builds upon the other technologies that we've mentioned on our podcast, like multi-factor authentication and single sign-on. So when it comes to conditional access, most IDPs will check if the credentials are valid. That's the first condition that has to be met generally to see if a user is granted access to a particular system or data. And then a lot of IDPs will have another condition that they could scope certain access around, which is usually a static network, subnet, or IP address. So for example, if I had valid credentials and I'm on a certain IP address or coming from a certain zone, I will get granted access. Or maybe I can apply the condition to multi-factor. And that, for the most part, is the basic building blocks of conditional access and what most identity providers have built into their solutions. Everything you've talked about so far, you could do in ADFS with a claim rule or claims rules, plural. And that's also an entry point for a lot of organizations is that's where they started. They had ADFS stood up for federating access to something like Azure AD or Office 365. And they had a condition that you must come from this IP block in order to be allowed access and of course have valid credentials. And I think that was kind of the the original conditional access back in the day, claim rules in ADFS. Yep. And then another thing that you could do is simply just block, say, Exchange from being used on non-managed machines. Right now, if you're, say, an O365 customer, they have this method where you can download it onto your personal device and sign in. You can block that and only allow it for managed devices. And that's another condition that could be met. But when it comes to Microsoft, I think they really have the best solution around this whole idea of conditional access because they have a whole bunch of different ways. If you're using a Windows computer or you're using Azure AD identity, they have different risk-based type conditional access, device-based conditional access, and you can get certain checks that will build upon the first conditions that we talked about where you're just verifying their identity if they have valid credentials or if they're coming from a certain network. Customers often cite conditional access as the number one reason they purchase Azure AD. So they purchase Azure AD Premium. There's two flavors of it. There's a P1 and a P2. The P1 gets you almost all the conditional access stuff, except for the sign-in risk and user risk controls, which are in P2. And we'll talk about those more as we go along today. So if you're using a SaaS application and you're using an identity provider, a lot of times you can't control the data once you've granted access to that user. So for example, if you're using Okta as an identity provider and you use Dropbox as a cloud storage and you're putting enterprise data within a, an enterprise tenant for Dropbox, if the user's credentials are valid and you haven't put any other network conditional access in place, that user can go ahead and install and connect to Dropbox on any device that has internet and pull down company data without any other checks in place. So most third-party IDPs just check those first couple conditions. And obviously, if the user has disabled credentials, they're not going to be able to gain access. But that check initially, as long as they have valid credentials, the app and its data are wide open to be put on any device. And then you don't have any controls on top of that to secure the data from exfiltration or download or anything else like that. 
if you think about it as well, not only does the identity provider allow you to have consistency across all your different SaaS applications so you have the same identity, but it also allows you to have a consistent security control plane. And that's what you'll hear all the time. You'll hear companies like Microsoft say identity is the new control plane. This is what they're talking about because when you have cloud applications that will accept valid credentials, you need a tool that allows you to layer in more controls on top of it. And that's what your identity provider can really do. And this also makes it so that those SaaS providers aren't required to do it themselves. Can you imagine how much of a bear it would be if you had to have different conditional access controls in Dropbox and Salesforce and ServiceNow and Workday, and you had to manage all of those separately. Having all of those fronted by a single identity provider and having a consistent control plane is super valuable. And that's what we're talking about here is the ability to set consistent controls across all of those applications, while at the same time being able to apply stronger controls to applications that are more sensitive. One of the things that some identity providers will have is a threat intelligence feed on the back end to look at something called sign-in risk. So I'll use Okta as an example here. They have threat intelligence built in on the back end if you turn it on where they're checking where an IP is coming from and they'll see if that IP has had any type of malicious behavior or if the IP is associated with a known malware or ransomware threat feed. And if it is, they'll go ahead and block that sign in. They'll also look at different behaviors where if from a specific IP, they're getting a bunch of denied requests consistent with like a password spraying or credential stuffing attempt, they'll also go ahead and block those sign-ins. I believe Microsoft also has a fairly good sign-in risk conditional access feature, right Adam? Yeah. And before we get into what's specific to Microsoft, I just want to zoom out a second and and make the broader point with you talking about all these capabilities in Okta, that this is why you start to hear people say that the cloud is a security imperative. It's no longer just a thing that you have to wrap your head around or become comfortable with or accept. It's the opposite. If you want to secure your organization in the best possible way, it is actually incumbent upon you to use the cloud now because that threat intelligence and all of those detections built into Okta, you are essentially offloading that from your own security team to have to do. That's duplicative work that they're already doing and they're already really good at. And at Microsoft, it's the same way. So a lot of the same things Andy talked about, there's two different kinds of risk detections in Azure Active Directory. One of them is sign-in risk, and that's determined in real time at the time of every single sign-in, where every sign-in is assigned a risk score, low, medium, or high, or no risk. And that's based on looking for any changes from what is normal normally accepted as a sign-in for that user. So is it a change in what operating system they're using or what country they're coming from or what IP range they're signing in from or time of day they're signing in? If any of those become anomalous, that threat level starts to tick upward. And that can also be kicked off by things like signing in from an anonymous IP, like through a Tor exit node. Then separately, there's also a concept of user risk. And user risk is a running risk score over time where all of those different risk events accumulate and change that score. Also, not every detection is real time. So there are some detections that happen offline. So for example, one nice thing Microsoft will do, if you're using password hash synchronization, which just means you're syncing your on-premises password hashes to the cloud, Microsoft will compare them against password dumps as they become available. So let's use a theoretical example. Let's say Andy had an Azure AD account and Andy reused his password from Yahoo. So he has his Yahoo password, his Azure AD password, they're one and the same. When Yahoo inevitably gets cracked and their database gets dumped and all of their passwords are available on the dark web, Microsoft will acquire it, whether that's working with the FBI or other three-letter government agencies, whether that's through their own threat intelligence or third-party threat intel, they'll get that password dump. They will run all of those passwords through the same hashing algorithm as all the other credentials in Azure AD, and they will do a comparison. And if anybody lights up on that, like say Andy's hashes match, Andy's user risk score will be immediately flagged as high and an alert will be generated. Now you can remediate that in an automated fashion. 
function. You can set a user risk policy to say, if user risk score equals high, then enforce an automatic self-service password reset. And so now the next time Andy signs in, the service will detect, hey, Andy, there's something wrong with your password. I need you to do a reset. And he'll be prompted for two non-password factors to reset his password and return to a healthy state. And all that happens automatically. Or there's one other interesting example, and, and I won't go into this with as much depth, but how cloud identity providers are protecting you. Alex Weiner from Microsoft just posted a blog post a couple weeks ago, and we should link to this in the show notes, about password spray and how Microsoft detects it. And it's super interesting just from a technical perspective of Microsoft is looking for common password hashes that are failing. So being attempted and failing across the entire service. So Azure AD is a globally distributed service, 900 billion authentications a month, and looking for those common failed attempts. Now, really sophisticated attackers today, they will do their password spray across thousands of different IP addresses. They will do them across thousands of user accounts, probably even crossing tenant boundaries. And that would be really, really, really hard to detect for any individual organization. But when you have the visibility of literally billions of authentications, darn near a trillion authentications a month, you can correlate them and then you can take action upon them. And so you can mark those as password spray attempts and start to block those IP ranges or block those sign-in attempts while still allowing valid sign-in attempts to proceed. So it's really, really interesting and we'll link to it in the show notes, but that's just an example of some of the benefits you get when you're with an identity provider that's in the cloud and some of the security they can add on to your account or your organization that you're just not going to have if you're trying to do it yourself on premises. And so think of that as you start to build in these conditional access policies, how much protection you're getting right in the front end, even without you building any sort of policy, you just kind of get a lot of that protection automatically. I have two anecdotes here to kind of build off of that. One was back in February, we had a bunch of executives who started getting these emails along with my boss from a independent contractor or security contractor who had obtained a list of quote unquote, our credentials on the dark web, probably matched up with our company email addresses in some sort of breach somewhere. Most of them were probably old, but you know, the question came down to us to kind of investigate whether or not these credentials were legitimate, if any any activity had been used on the accounts outside of normal activity. And, you know, at the time, my pitch was, you know, if we had self-service password reset enabled, if we had risk-based conditional access where the rule that you're talking about, Adam, if a breach credential matches on Microsoft's threat feed to automatically trigger that self-service password reset, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have even had to worry about it because the whole response would have been automated. That as soon as a password becomes breached and, and known in that threat feed, the user would automatically be prompted for a self-service password reset. And so that's kind of what prompted our company to kind of start moving in that direction to get it implemented. Of course, like we're still working on the licensing for risk-based conditional access because that does take a uh, different licensing. But either way, as we've talked about, security is a journey. And so it's good to have a roadmap to kind of build on, on certain things to get there. The other anecdote I have is on the sign-in risk and, and also on user risk, but there's a signal that I, we may have mentioned before called impossible travel, where if you sign in from, say, the United States and then a few seconds or minutes later you sign in in North Korea, there's going to be an alert for impossible travel because you can't be in two places that quickly. So this is notoriously a very busy alert. It prompts quite a bit. And there's a lot of false positives because sometimes due to where data centers are located geographically, a user may be physically located, say in Japan, but then hit an Azure data center within the United States, and that will trigger an impossible travel just due to the physical locations. So it is very hard to separate out those signals. But if you're able to tune this down and accept certain risk, Say you know you have data centers in the United States and you know you have employees in Japan and you go ahead and accept the risk and you're going to exclude alerts from those two countries if they originate or go to those countries. Then you start to narrow down those signals. And I was at a company where unfortunately we missed one of these impossible travel alerts because it's busy and InfoSec analysts and operations folks go through alert fatigue. The attacker had persistent access to a user's account due to some sort of credential phishing attempt. And we didn't have MFA enabled at the time. And so as long as the credentials were valid, the attacker kept persistent access. And throughout weeks, he would send out little reconnaissance emails to people just to make sure he had access still. And we found all of this out afterwards. 
But eventually, he laid his attack and sent you know, the email from this user to a financial group requesting funds to be transferred to a country with an account where the country had customers that my company was working with, but this wasn't one of them. And of course, there were other processes that were broke during this attack where, say, finance was supposed to have certain people approve it or verify that this was a legitimate request and it wasn't. So oftentimes during these type of attacks, there are several things that have to happen and chips have to fall in place in order for the attack to be successful. And that kind of happened. And so in the end, the company ended up paying a a bogus invoice and and losing out a bunch of money. But if we had those tunings in place, if we had that sign-in risk in place, and we were able to successfully identify this, we could have prevented it. So that's those are two kind of antidotes that I have for conditional access and sign-in risk and user risk in my experience. So moving on to device-based conditional access, we talked about how if you have valid credentials, you can install certain applications on a non-managed machine. And Adam, you have a really unique way of looking at this that I, I would like you to kind of explain because I think a lot of people look at an enterprise or company device and then they look at personal devices and there's this separation between the two and they feel like you don't own this device so I don't want you to do anything to this device but I'm going to go ahead and put company data on it whereas I think companies should start shifting in the mindset of let's let our customers use the device they want to use but make sure that that is compliant with our security controls. Ultimately, device ownership doesn't really affect the security posture of the device in and of itself. That's not a security control. Well, we own the device, you know, in the legal sense, own the device, but how does that help you secure it better? And I think this comes from the mindset where there used to be such a gap between the controls you could enforce on a corporate owned device using things like system center configuration manager and group policy compared to what you could do on a personal device because there was a big gap without that domain join, without GPO, without SCCM, you couldn't enforce all of the policy you needed to. And so I think that's where that mindset comes from is it did require ownership for all of those things to happen. But what has really changed is the tools available to do that today. So if you were building a company net new today and you wanted to have Windows machines, you would not on-premises domain join them. You would cloud join them directly to Azure AD, which means you would not have GPO, which means you would need to enforce all of that policy through Intune or Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And if you really wanted the extra layer of control, you could do co-management with Intune Plus Configuration Manager. But either way, the larger point stands that you would not do domain join if you were Greenfield today. You would not do GPO. So we need to get our mind away from the fact that those are requirements because they are not. You could build a perfectly functional company without them. And so Once we've wrapped our mind around that and we've accepted that there's no reason we can't have the same level of control, regardless of the ownership of the device, then we should become less concerned with it. And we should turn our focus to, does this device meet all my security controls? Yes or no. And if it does, we should let it get to company resources. So this is how Microsoft actually operates today. You can connect a Windows PC that Microsoft does not own to Microsoft. You can enroll it in Intune. It will become co-managed with System Center Configuration Manager. Microsoft will put Defender ATP on it, or I guess I should call it by the new name, Defender for Endpoint, and it will look and function pretty much like a corporate-owned Microsoft device. The ownership doesn't really matter the level of control you can put on it. You can enroll a Macintosh. I have done that. You can enroll your personal devices, iOS and Android. So ultimately, complete separation of the model of it matters who legally owns the device, and we move to a model where is this device compliant with our policies? And now, once we're doing that, it's really nice if our identity provider can validate that. So this is device-based conditional access is what we're talking about. I want to gain access to a resource. Let's say Exchange Online, my email. I show up to Azure AD and I could be a Windows device. I could be a Mac. I could be iOS. I could be Android. When I show up, Azure AD is going to go check a flag on my device identity. And that flag is, is compliant. And it's a Boolean, true or false. Now, the only thing that can write to that flag is Microsoft Intune. And it changes that flag if the device 
device ever becomes non-compliant. And a compliance policy can look for things like encryption, secure boot, password policy, operating system version, antivirus status, and based on that, flag the devices to or false. So the experience you get as an organization is when a device shows up to the front door and says it wants access to a thing, it is validated that it is healthy and in a compliant state. And if it becomes in a non-compliant state, it becomes unhealthy, it can automatically be removed from accessing those company resources. Again, we're automating all of that. So your security team doesn't have to spend their time worrying about it. Oh, hey, Jane's device um, didn't install the latest update. We should go knock on her door and, and yell at her to stop using email. If that happens automatically, it's much better. And then to take it one step further, you can tie threat protection solutions into that as well. So of course, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint runs on all of those same device platforms now, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Windows, and the threat level of the device, low, medium, or high, can be factored into that compliance decision as well. And you can say for the device to be compliant, the threat level must be low or none. So if Jane in accounting downloads some malware on her device and Microsoft Defender for Endpoint detects it and flags the device as a medium threat risk, again, Jane is automatically removed from having access to corporate email or any other applications that are fronted with the identity provider. That is device-based conditional access. And that's where it gets super powerful is now we're using more and more signals as we've gone through our conversation today. And we've moved from what Andy started off with by saying, we're going to look for valid credentials and maybe we're going to look at what network you're coming from. And now we've layered into, we're going to look at the risk of your sign-in. We're going to look at the risk of your user identity. We're going to look at health of your device. And now we're layering in all of those data points to make an access decision. And you start to understand how powerful this truly becomes. And really, this is how you get to a more zero trust-like model, where zero trust states you should never trust and always verify. Think of all the things that we're validating at every sign-in, device health, sign-in health, user health, etc. So that is device-based conditional access. What I think blew my mind when it comes to device management as a security professional was that I could go into a Best Buy or order some sort of laptop off the shelf that's a Windows device, join it to Azure AD right from the out-of-box experience to an Azure tenant and automatically apply all the security configurations that I need on that device and it becomes a company device and acts like a company device. Because Windows 10 is a user-based license, if I'm assigned a license, it'll automatically upgrade that to Windows 10 Enterprise. It will deploy all the applications that are assigned to my user. So if I have Defender for Endpoint, you know that will automatically get applied. Or if I have a third-party Endpoint protection solution, I can have that MSI automatically deploy through Intune. I can make sure Windows Hello is turned on. I can make sure Windows Credential Guard, all sorts of other things are turned on to make sure that that device is in a secure state. And then what Adam is saying is continually check the compliance of that device to make sure that that device stays in that configuration. And if it doesn't, it revokes the, the access to company data. So that in itself, I think, is a revolutionary idea where you can take any computer, join it to your Azure tenant, and it becomes a secure company managed device based on the policies that you've defined as a security professional. Andy, that's not a flying car. That's a that's a real thing. That's how I got my new Surface Book 3 in the mail a couple months ago, because my Surface Book 1 was really getting long in the tooth. And the only extra piece I'd add on to what you said is autopilot was stood up on it. So it took it one step further to everything you just said, or when I booted it up, it automatically recognized that it was part of Microsoft Corporation and prompted me for my Microsoft corporate credentials. But otherwise, exactly as you described, Azure AD join get policy, upgrade to Windows 10 Enterprise, get apps, get configuration, install my VPN, install my antivirus solution, install my EDR solution, install my apps. And it just shipped with the image that came with the device. And we upgraded it to get it to where it needed to be to be a work-ready device. And that's really, really powerful. But that's, that's a real thing. That's not a fantasy land. You can get there if you're really motivated to do it. And it's the same thing with Macs too. Intune has controls for Mac built in. And another vendor that's in this space that has been very good and a partner of Microsoft is Jamf. And one of the things that Jamf does really well is they also integrate with Intune conditional access. So what you can do is trigger that conditional access to make sure that if you're connecting to any type of Azure onboarded app or Microsoft application, that it will trigger a conditional access to make sure that that Mac is enrolled in Jamf. And if it's 
it's not, then access gets denied. And then you apply all of your conditions through Jamf to make sure that the device has the applications deployed, it has the correct encryption applied, password on the screen and all of that. So just because you're on a, a Mac doesn't mean that you're out of luck when it comes to conditional access. Jamf is a well-respected partner in the device management space, and they integrate with conditional access with Intune if you're an O365 customer too. Let's give Apple a ton of credit here, which doesn't happen a lot on an enterprise-focused show, but Apple basically invented all of these concepts, and they got it right pretty much on the first try all the way back in iOS 4. The whole concept of taking a known good image and transforming it to become an enterprise-ready device. They debuted that whole concept of configuration profiles and MDM, and the way they designed MDM to function was incredibly prescient, and they did that all the way back. So iOS 4, iPhone 4, that was 2010. So that's literally 10 years ago, kind of turned the whole idea on its head of stop imaging. Why why are you replacing the known good OS on the device and instead transform the OS? And then they kind of took it the step further with automated device enrollment or what used to be called DEP, the device enrollment program. And that's the idea that you can take a brand new device off the shelf, shrink wrapped, and it is already joined to your organization and has to join your organization's management infrastructure. Windows Autopilot was really just a kind of adapting that concept and idea to Windows. And it's a great idea. And Apple really invented all of this. And it's amazing how they got it right so often on the first try with everything they did. And just to your other point around Jamf, I think you undersold it a little bit. Jamf is the Rolls Royce of Mac management. Intune can meet a lot of use cases. And you should start with Intune and see if it will meet your organization's needs. But if it doesn't, there's a clean path to go to Jamf and still use the same conditional access controls and integration. And they really are the everything of Mac management. If you're going to manage Macs, you should do Intune or Jam for nothing else because that kind of gives you the cleanest path to whatever level of complexity you need. They're a great organization and mad respect for them. If you have been listening to our podcast and all of the episodes that we had previously, we kind of started with identity. And I made this point that when you're picking an identity provider, if you haven't yet, you really need to take a hard look at the strategic value of using something like Microsoft Azure AD as your identity provider for your SaaS apps. Because when it comes to conditional access for those apps, if they're not onboarded with Microsoft, then you can't apply conditional access to say Intune. So for example, if you had Dropbox or Box or some other SaaS app that you are using Azure AD as the identity provider, you can apply conditional access to a device to say, if you try to install this app on this device, it first has to be compliant. The other thing that you can do is when it comes to cloud app security, you can apply different conditions on out of band access or what's referred to as a reverse proxy back to a cloud app security to apply conditional access. So Microsoft has Microsoft Cloud App Security. And what's really cool about this is if you're on a non-managed machine or on a managed machine, it doesn't matter, but you can specify those conditions. As you're accessing those apps, you can look at different conditions, like if this is a hybrid Azure AD join machine, or if this is an Intune compliant machine, or if you're coming from a even a domain join machine, you can do that within MCAS. And if you're accessing, say, your email and you want to download an attachment, you can block that attachment or you can allow it, or you can even apply in real time Azure Information Protection and encrypt that document for read-only access. If it's on, say, grandma's computer during Thanksgiving, and you need to really check your email, and I have to download this spreadsheet that has company data on it, well, I'll go ahead and allow you to do that, but I'm going to encrypt it with AIP and allow only read access to the document. So all of that is built in using Azure as its identity provider. So with third-party apps, you can do the same thing. I often demo it with Salesforce when I'm showing it to customers. But, you know, you you kind of bring up two points I want to touch on there. Number one, just to tie off on the discussion around device-based conditional access, you mentioned a term that we haven't discussed on the show yet, and it's hybrid Azure AD join. And it's a huge mouthful, but the very short version is it's a way to take your on-premises domain join devices and enlighten Azure AD to their existence, essentially. And it is mostly, think of it as kind of an attestation 
location and time that this device is part of your organization. And that's really all it attests to. So that's another device-based conditional access control you can use. I often describe it as the easy button. If you want to get started with device-based conditional access controls, it's a great place to start because it's easy to turn on. It's literally like a GPO and then all your Windows devices will do it. And then you can start looking for known company devices and writing policy around them as opposed to things you probably shouldn't do anymore, like look at network condition, like what network you're coming from. So it's a great place to get started. But for all our discussion and enthusiasm around real-time adaptive device-based conditional access controls, this is not because it's a it's a point-in-time thing. It's not going to change or go away if the device becomes unhealthy or compromised or anything else. So keep that in mind. It's still incumbent on you to manage and monitor the health of the device and take control to prevent it from accessing company resources if appropriate, because the identity provider is not going to be able to do that for you. And then the other thing I wanted to tie off on, you talked about the cloud proxy for Microsoft Cloud App Security and how you can selectively decide which sessions you might send to that. And in general, when I talk about conditional access features with customers, I encourage them to think bigger because oftentimes what customers will do is they'll apply really basic policy sets that kind of are a re-implementation of things they were doing before. And so it might be like, if you're on a managed device, you don't have to do MFA, but if you're not on a managed device, you do. Or if you're on a trusted network, you don't have to do MFA, but if you're not on the network, you do. That's really too static. And and I think we talked about this on like our very first show. Think more dynamically. Think bigger. How can I write policy that differentiates per application risk level? If you have an HR information system like a Workday or a SuccessFactors, that should have stronger controls on it than a lot of your other applications. And you can do that with conditional access policies. So look into stuff like that too. And then Andy, totally switching gears for a second, but kind of related. There was a tweet, and we're going to put this in the show notes by Alex Simons, who's a CVP of identity at Microsoft. And it's talking about this new technology Microsoft's rolling out called continuous access evaluation. So if you're familiar under the covers with how a lot of identity providers work, especially if they're based on things like OpenID Connect, you have these different concepts of tokens. You have session tokens and access tokens and refresh tokens. And I can't speak to the other implementations, but I can speak to how it's done in Azure AD. You have a pair of tokens, an access token and a refresh token. The access token is valid for one hour, no more, no less. It is a bearer token. If I possess the access token, I get access to whatever thing it is authorized for. Say access to exchange online, like a mailbox. It cannot be revoked. So if I decide later, I don't want Andy to have that access token anymore, I have to wait for the hour to be up. Now, on the other hand, there's also paired with every access token, a refresh token. There's a whole bunch of rules around how often you can exchange refresh tokens. But basically the idea is a refresh token can be revoked. So I can pull it away from you and say, Andy, your refresh token is no longer good. But normally under normal behavior, you can keep exchanging that refresh token for another access token every hour. Every hour I need a new access token, give me another one, give me another one, give me another one. Now, as you're listening to me describe this and you've heard me say an hour, no more, no less, and you think of very contentious separations in your organization when an hour of access after you terminate someone is, you know, about 59 minutes too long, you have now experienced a pain point that many organizations have. This is not ideal. So this new technology, continuous access evaluation, puts all this on its head, kind of gets away with that old model and moves to a new model where access is continuously evaluated. And if you should no longer have access to a thing, you're going to be removed from accessing it in much closer to real time. And this is continuously evaluating conditional access policies as well. So with that previous model I described, you'd also see experiences like if you're on corporate network, you don't need MFA. If you're off corporate network, you need MFA. And I would get customers back when you know you could go places who would complain that, hey, Bob was just testing this out and he went to Starbucks and he never got prompted for MFA. What's the deal? And I'd have to explain that you have to wait an hour after you leave corporate network before that new access token is going to get renewed and you're going to get prompted for any conditional access policies. So this is really cool technology, really turns it on its ear and significantly shrinks that risk that was inherent with the old model where you had that minimum hour of access pretty much no matter what you did. So check out that tweet, check out the blog post. Um, It's really just interesting technology if you're a technologist and, and kind of like to see how this stuff works under the covers. 
Yeah, another quick anecdote before we close out the podcast. When I left one of my companies as a security professional, I know that my coworker was hovering over the button to disable my account as soon as I walked through the threshold on my last day. It wasn't because it was a contentious separation. It was just more because I was an information security professional and I had access to high level and sensitive data and systems. And so when he disabled my account, I still technically had a little bit of access until that access token expired. So you know, that that is the risk that Adam was referring to. And, and of course, with this continuous access evaluation, it minimizes that quite a bit. And then the other plug I wanted to put out there is on Adam's LinkedIn. He has been creating some fantastic content on some demos for Microsoft security. And one of the videos directly relates to this episode, which is the, a device-based conditional access in MCAS. And it's outstanding. I highly recommend it. If you're interested in actually implementing it, watch the video and, and walk through some of the steps that Adam demonstrated demonstrates because he he'll go into detail on how to actually turn on these rules and what rules to configure and show you in real time how it actually works. So check out Adam's LinkedIn, which is going to be in the show notes. So that's our time for today. There's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voice message or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.